So everyone, I think we can get started then. Um, my name is Anne Harrod Lang. I'm the executive director of PHAP, that's short for the International Association of Professionals in Humanitarian Assistance and Protection. I am really delighted to be serving as your host and moderator for today's webinar entitled Partnerships and Principles in Conflict Contexts, Voices from Nigeria and South Sudan, in which we will be discussing the results of a new research report on how partnership and humanitarian principles are perceived and implemented in two specific contexts. So with that, we will turn to the substance of today's event. A large part of humanitarian action is carried out via partnerships between international and local actors. Thus, how humanitarians approach partnerships really does have a major effect on how our sector operates. These partnerships, as we know, have often been one-sided and unequal with the bulk of risk associated with programs being transferred to local actors. However, there has been increased attention uh, recently on how these partnerships are structured in practice, including through the localization and grand bargain processes and the principles of partnership. A considerable part of these partnerships are, as we know, in conflict settings where being guided by the humanitarian principles or what are often referred to, uh, what is often referred to as principled humanitarian action is particularly relevant and important. And the intersection of these questions related to partnerships and following humanitarian principles is the focus of today's event. And today's event, it's serving as the launch event uh, of a very interesting new report on this topic. We'll be diving into that um, throughout this hour and a half. Um, in the second half of last year, 2020, two research teams engaged with more than 123 local actors operating in the humanitarian delivery space in northeastern Nigeria and South Sudan to investigate how partnerships and humanitarian principles were implemented in these two specific contexts. This research was commissioned by Danish Church Aid, the Dutch Relief Alliance, Caritas Norway, Kinder Nothilfe, and Norway. Norwegian Church Aid and was carried out by the Partnership Brokers Association. Now to discuss the results of this research, uh, as well as the implications, we'll be joined today by the principal investigators from both research teams, representatives of local organizations in these two contexts, as well as experts on global policy. Um, uh, just a note, uh, I believe we are still working on connecting uh, one of the principal investigators, so we will continue to try to get him on the line. In the meantime, I will introduce our, our other speakers and hope that uh, Esbaba will, will be able to join us shortly. Uh, otherwise, I believe we do have um, another colleague who is who is able to jump in if needed. Um, so we'll, we'll pl play that a little bit by ear. But let me now introduce um, four out of our, our five speakers today. Um, uh, so, uh, first of all, uh, Jok Maruchok is the principal investigator for the South Sudan team. He's senior policy analyst at the Sud Institute and professor in the Department of Anthropology at Syracuse University in New York. A warm welcome to you, Jok. And to uh, help us relate the research findings to the realities on the ground faced by local and national NGOs, we are joined by Gloria Soma, the director of the TT Foundation, an NGO operating in South Ooh. Sudan. Welcome, Gloria. Now to uh, share some perspectives from the international NGO side of partnerships, we're very happy to have with us Jonas Vesager Nedeker, uh, international director at Dan Church Aid. Uh, Thank welcome, you very Jonas. much. Welcome. Last but not least, we're joined by Veronique Barbelay, Senior Research Fellow with ODI HPN, who has studied these and related questions Hello. from a global perspective and in several different operational contexts. Welcome, Veronique. Now, I see that um, 
let's see. We have had uh, a number of um, participants who were uh, responding to the polls prior to the event uh, indicate that they had looked at the report and others we know are coming to this fresh. Uh, we will be hearing from the principal investigator soon to help us walk through some of the results. Uh, but first, I would like to turn to Jonas, uh, as Dan Church Aid was one of the organizations that commissioned this research. Could I ask you, Jonas, what was it that prompted you uh, and your partner organizations to investigate partnerships and principled action? And what was really the problem that you were trying to address with this effort? Over to you, Thank Jonas. you very much. Um, I think there are many things in this, but uh, Dan Church Aid, along with the other uh, organization that commissioned the study, are part of the Charter for Change and the signatory to that. And in that sense, localization, of course, is, is crucial and, and an integrated part of the the way we work, we work through and with national partners, if we use that terminology. Um, but we also discovered that, particularly in conflict situation, when we have the dialogue with, with the donors that we engage with, they quite often sort of express some sort of, of distrust or uh, with regards to, to national partners, with regards to their ability to stay neutral or impartial in humanitarian situation when it's a conflict. And that became very, very uh, clear when we had the last annual meeting back in uh, December 2000. Uh, yeah, 2019, which was held in Copenhagen, where we had quite a lot of the uh, Charter for Change signatory organizations in Copenhagen. And for them, this, this really became a key topic that came up. So we really felt that there was there was not enough uh, light being put on, on the situation of national partners engaging in humanitarian situations and how you do that with a partnership, but still being adherent to, to the humanitarian principles that we all uh, sign up to, because there's something in that equation that's truly important important because we are seeing, I would say, over, over the years that national partners are becoming even more important in terms of reaching to those most affected in conflict situations because they can get access through uh, different uh, approaches by building trust uh, with communities and only through that can you really deliver humanitarian aid. So if we don't recognize this but stick to the principles and even have from donors' side um, a reluctance to actually understand their new neutrality and impartiality in that context, it's really difficult to move forward in the conversation. So that was part of the reason why we commissioned this study. Great, right, thank you. Um, and to follow up on that, was there a particular example or a particular incident that highlighted for you the need to look at this question more deeply? As, as I said, I think the annual meeting we had, but the other thing I think is sort of that uh, stark development that we have seen when we look at humanitarian workers being affected in conflict situation by attacks, uh, either losing their life or, or limbs or other thing, because we are seeing that mostly it's it's national partners that 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 carry out most of the works. It, that sort of 100% increase we've seen on a, over a 10-year period have, of course, mostly affected national partners and staff of national partners, humanitarian workers for, uh, from national partners. So understanding, again, if, in order to understand that they are actually the organizations and partners that are most at risk when carrying out humanitarian operations. Great. Thanks so much for uh, for leading us into the to, to the discussion um, in this way. That's very helpful, Jonas. Um, now I'd like to check if we do have Espaba on the line. Yes, I'm on the I line. I think we were able to get him by phone. Hi. Okay. Fantastic. I'm I'm so glad you were able to join. Hi, uh, that, that's great. So uh, we'd like to now um, start out with looking at the results of the research. And I would like to turn to you first on this, Esbaba, and ask about how you approached the subject of the research, partnerships and local actors. Uh, when we talk about local actors in the context of partnerships, uh, we often think about UN agencies or international NGOs partnering with national NGOs. What were your assumptions as you went into this research in Nigeria, and were those assumptions challenged? Uh, over to you, Baba. You have the floor. All right. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think I'd I, I like to start to highlight that um, the term local actor has been highly debated in the humanitarian space for quite a while. Um, so uh, for us, it was um, obvious that we need to set out to explore that universe of local actors that may be defined um, or described by the local actors themselves, getting their perspective. 
And in this instance, we're talking about uh, people working um, at the coal face in the uh, humanitarian area, um, government uh, representatives, um, national NGOs, um, CBOs, faith-based organizations, even within the communities themselves. Um, we, 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 we reached out to uh, gatekeepers and we reached out to other members of the communities. An entire spectrum um, of, uh, uh, from people who handle just strategy in the humanitarian field and those who, got, who work right at the coal face level. Um, and it really wasn't, um, it, it wasn't something we would call a research. We just created space for listening and um, encouraging people to talk. Um, there was a genuine inquiry to understand the perspective of local actors. Um, and it was, we made a point of engaging local voices. Um, in the Nigerian context, we looked at three states, uh, the um, Borno, the Adamawa, and the Yobe state area. And in each of those areas, we focused on people working directly in the field and people working in the office, trying to make sure that there's a, a correlation in, in perspective. So we worked with them, co-created, co-conducted them analysis, and we jointly developed um, you know, we facilitated the ability to jointly develop um, recommendations or ways, uh, what they consider to be the ways to go. Um, interestingly, with regards to who is a local humanitarian actor, um, we had asked the uh, interviewers to explain in whichever way they wanted to explain. And we found out that on uh, looking at all the um, um, submissions that they made, they looked at domiciliation in the sense that somebody who is uh, domiciled within the context, within the conflict area, uh, who is knowledgeable about it, um, somebody who is um, uh, able to navigate the different things that you can find within the conflict area. Then they went ahead and mentioned local NGOs, CBOs, youth organizations, women groups, and, and, and you know, the national NGOs as well. So one could see that there's a diverse range of actors as perceived by the local actors. But one thing is certain, they are all essential in the delivery of humanitarian programs. And it goes well beyond just looking at the national NGOs and um, it, it even reaches out uh, their perspective that the perception actually reaches out to bringing out people from within the community to be part of the partnership landscape. So in, in effect, what we, what we therefore get to see is that it's not a single hierarchical um, relationship, but that there's so very many hands uh, so that requires being, um, having a handshake. Um, it uh, could be horizontal, could be vertical, but all of those uh, diverse nature of uh, actors uh, just tell us that within the uh, conflict context, there is more than just a vertical, um, hierarchical relationship. And then you also ask about uh, what were some of our underlying assumptions. Um, we, we could get from, um, one could get from the terms of reference that um, are implicit in the research is that partnerships between local and international actors can better contribute to the delivery of principled and effective humanitarian aid. We explored this, and while that assumption was upheld by participants, there was, uh, in fact, there was not a everything is good and hunky dory. It was more like there remains a large amount of work to maximize the benefits that are inherent in partnerships in the humanitarian landscape in Nigeria. There was a second. Um, um, underlying assumption, um, which is to the effect that humanitarian principles are a blocker to the acceleration of localization and may impact negatively on the design and implementation of humanitarian uh, collaboration, of course, which down, now includes the partnership. However, the study revealed that local actors do not consider the humanitarian principles as being blockers. Um, in fact, they take them on willingly and, and try to, to the best of their ability, 
um, as, they, as they describe it, you know, implement in line with the principles. What they emphasize is that parties to the delivery of the um, aid process, to the uh, humanitarian aid process, need to come together and collaborate on an effective, a more effective deployment of the principles. Number one, based on a better understanding of the context, um, you know, and also expecting that the main drivers of the humanitarian process, that the INGOs and the, and the funders, should and, um, attempt, should try as much as possible to accommodate the additional, should I use the term, strategies or modes of working that they, that is the local actors, uh, utilize successfully in navigating the environment when they are going about delivering human aid, uh, human aid and human uh, programs. Um, the third one is that the um, local and the national NGOs are not principled. Um, you know, the, the study revealed, contrary to that, one thing that we need to put in mind is that the COVID actually complicated our ability to reach beyond uh, the numbers we reached. Um, you know, uh, in Nigeria at that time, there, there were no traveling around, um, and uh, you could only come together in your, uh, your local areas up to a maximum of 20 people. So we had to rely a lot on virtual engagement. Nevertheless, we were lucky to have uh, states people resident in those states. So it was easy to have one-on-one -on -one in that regard. So we had a total number of uh, 72 persons, of which 73% of them were local actors in the way they, decide, they, they, they describe the um, government representative, um, local government people, um, uh, local NGOs, um, um, should I use every, um, community people, gatekeepers in particular, those people who facilitate access in and out of the um, uh, community area. So we had about 72 persons of which 73 percent, about 52 or 53, if I recollect rightly, were local actors. We also had an online survey in which we had about 55 respondents. Um, from there, we were able to pick some things that um, uh, the local actors, you know, desired change in, where they felt there should be some changes in. Um, we also found where they felt some things are lacking. In terms of the changes, they wanted increased um, collaboration and strategy among themselves. They wanted stronger financial risk management and accountability vis-a-vis -vis the vertical relationship. And um, they also did highlight that um, government was not really present. So they desired um, stronger government leadership role. In terms of what they did not see or what they felt was not good enough, um, they felt that there were no equitable relationships between themselves, the funders, and all, you know, there were not equitable relationships. Um, that the power imbalance between the funders and the local actors was pretty obvious, and that they felt sidelined in the scheme of things. Um, all, of this, all of this came out from, uh, you know, the, the interviews we had one-on-one -on -one and the surveys and the um, three focus group discussions, each in every of those three states. Um, we had an e-contribution an e workshop that pulled all the three states together and folks in Abuja, and then we had that one big e-contribution workshop. Um, and then we had two uh, partnership learning conversations with existing partnerships. There were two existing partnerships, and we had the four uh, partners, I mean, in, 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 in there, and we had that engagement with them. So in, in a not, in, in, uh, well, I think I've taken quite some time, but that's how the methodology went, and that's how we got to appreciate what the local actors considered to be a definition for themselves. 
Great. Thank, thank you very much, Asbaba. Uh, really appreciate that. And uh, based on uh, both the previous poll that uh, we had up where people shared a lot of the specific issues uh, that they had experienced, as well as now the poll we're looking at currently where we see um, in real time what today's event um, uh, audience uh, uh, thinks about the scope of what we mean in the term um, local actor. It was clearly a very important place to start um, uh, with with this study that that you and your colleagues undertook, and it sounds like some very interesting um, some very interesting insights unearthed just through asking uh, this initial kind of question about what we mean by um, by local actor and and how um, how uh, local actors perceive themselves uh, and and uh, and their colleagues in that space. Um, so thank you very much for that. I would like to turn now um, to to look at the second context um, that was part of this research effort, uh, namely South Sudan, and would like to turn to Jok. Um, how did you approach the question of who were the relevant local actors uh, in, in that context? And were the answers any different from what was found in Nigeria? Jok, you have the floor. Thank you very much, ma'am, and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, good morning, wherever you are. Uh, so. Uh, I concur with S. Baba on, on the extensive explanation of what the local people thought was the meaning of local actor, or who is a local actor and who is not. We started with, uh, with, with the registered uh, national NGOs in South Sudan. Uh, we picked randomly from uh, several sources. One of the most important one is the, the South Sudan uh, National NGO Forum. Uh, which has uh, or close to 500 members. Uh, these are national NGOs. And, uh, and then we'll pick from uh, other NGOs that have partnered in the past, who are current partners with international NGOs like Oxfam. Um, and we selected uh, the, the numbers of people that we, we, we were to interview. So we can begin by saying that in that case, the local actors referred specifically in that case to people who are working as in humanitarian field for national NGOs. Uh, but in terms of uh, the overall uh, idea of local actor, we expanded it to include uh, what Esbaba referred to as gatekeepers. So these are uh, people who give access to humanitarian uh, NGOs and, and international NGOs and the UN, uh, including uh, South Sudan has uh, something called the uh, uh, humanitarian disaster management office um, uh, call um, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's a commission, it's a cabinet level commission and there is also a minister or a ministry of humanitarian affairs and disaster management and these are uh, part of the gate gatekeepers in terms of uh, uh, initial contact between international NGOs and uh, the UN and, and, and the donors. That's where it begins. And then you have local uh, government officials, uh, county commissioners, uh, who are uh, administrators of the area where the humanitarian uh, uh, deliveries are being made. Those ones also uh, can be described as local actors, as gatekeepers. Then you have um, the security agencies in the in the case of South Sudan particularly every foreign NGO involved in humanitarian deliveries or in research in assessment they have to obtain uh, security clearance uh, from national security services or from local police uh, if, 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 if you are in a remote location working far away from the capital Juba uh, so the local actors concept uh, expands far beyond those people who are actually involved in the delivery of aid to include everybody who has to uh, be asked uh, uh, permission and who has to be seen as the regulator, including the ministry that I just mentioned. Um, and so there is concurrence with Nigeria in terms of the uh, expansive feel of the concept of, of humanitarian local actors. Um, in regards to uh, how we approach this and what assumptions uh, um, uh, we were going into with, uh, the first thing is that we have to distinguish between humanitarian aid 
uh, in the context of conflict and humanitarian aid in any other type of situations, including public health uh, emergencies, like when AIDS was a problem, now uh, this current pandemic, uh, uh, COVID-19, or uh, uh, flooding, such as what happened in Yongle on the eastern part of South Sudan. Uh, there is a, while, while all of these contexts require uh, similar principles of humanitarian delivery, uh, there is definitely a need to distinguish between a humanitarian crisis triggered by a conflict and a humanitarian crisis triggered by natural disasters. Uh, and the main reason for this distinction is that uh, humanitarian agencies from outside uh, approach that from the point of view that, uh, that it has to be monitored and supervised uh, at, every, at all levels by international agencies because the local actors, uh, be they uh, government officials or uh, NGO workers, are, are sort of partisan in the conflict and therefore cannot be entirely trusted to do equitable and principled humanitarian work. And as a result, uh, we went in to ask the NGOs to specify whether this assumption is something that they have to, they have encountered and, and, and deal with, whether uh, their partners in, in, the, in the form of international NGOs and the donors do actually view local NGOs as partisan and as uh, not capable of being uh, principled because of um, being party of various levels of conflict that triggered humanitarian intervention in the first place. And, and the finding, the primary finding in that is, 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 is was that, uh, that the local NGOs uh, did not necessarily push back on whether, on who is most unprincipled, local or international. But they offered uh, the viewpoint that uh, this is based requires negotiation so that there is a clear understanding of the nuances and the context and the complexities of human relations that happen when there is a crisis and when there is aid from outside. And they focus on ensuring that they establish their own local NGOs uh, for the uh, express purpose of moral obligation to help their people. So on what basis now should they be regarded as unprincipled when in fact they, they chose to go into the field with that in mind that uh, there is a crisis, there are people who are suffering, they need help. And we locally here are the ones, not only because they are our own people, but because we also understand their cultures, their social interactions better than anybody who could come from outside. And, and therefore, we, we go into the, into the humanitarian field with that in mind, that we know the context better, we have compassion for the people, and we've got to deliver to save lives. So on what basis could they be regarded as unprincipled or untrustworthy or a partisan or uh, are going to possibly divert aid to the warring sides and so forth, when in fact they were the ones who went in with that uh, primary principle of, con of, of compassion. So that was a very important finding that, yes, we are definitely uh, focused on ensuring that the uh, humanitarian aid is done in the most compassionate and most principled way because there, there is a crisis. But they also said that part of the reason why they, uh, they get to be seen in this way is the fact that the government of South Sudan has relinquished uh, its fundamental responsibility for welfare which is the, the, the thing that necessitated intervention from outside, is the fact that if, you, if people are hungry or people are insecure, insecure or people are affected by whatever crisis there is, the fundamental responsibility for welfare of those people relies with the state, with the government. But the government is not there. And for a very long time, South Sudan, unlike Nigeria, has been in this crisis since 1991. Not just the crisis, but the interventions. Uh, beginning with uh, Operation Lifeline Sudan and, and many other operations in, 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 the, in between until this moment, such that aid has become part of a subculture. And the way to do it in the most principled way is to, uh, to rely on local actors.
uh, because they know the terrain, they know how to, to mediate and be uh, uh, sort of the, 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 the middle people between the government, which has failed in its responsibility to protect people, and the international NGOs that are coming in with the suspicion that the government is a bad guy, the South Sudanese are partisan and they will not be principled. And the NGOs say that we stand in the middle to try to interpret and navigate that terrain, which is, uh, can be treacherous and can be uh, uh, ridden with mistrust. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jock. Now, we do have, um, we have a question for you. I would have to ask you to, uh, to be very brief because we have a lot more of ground to cover, but I would like to, to pose this question to you now um, before we move on. Uh, this is a, a question that's come in from, uh, from Rahman, and he writes, when you say gatekeepers, um, uh, who are so many different kinds of stakeholders, really, how do you experience their role in terms of uh, being either enablers or inhibitors of local leadership? Uh, how do you see their role in facilitating or not or otherwise um, better relief access to affected communities? Over to you. No, no, no connection. Ah, okay. Uh, we've lost the connection. Okay. Uh, in the in the meantime, um, so this should be very quick. I just want to point out on the on the poll results here. Um, it's very interesting. We do have. Um, it looks like we have a wide variety of views um, in the the group gathered here online today uh, regarding the scope of uh, what what they think of as a as a local actor. Um, but quite a quite a large number, um, up to a third of the people in the virtual room today, um, uh, really including. Um, as uh, as both Esbaba and, and Jock were mentioning, uh, mem members of national government uh, agencies, uh, local government, as part um, part of that scope, but but certainly uh, a large number who take a more narrow um, a more narrow perspective on um, on the scope of local actor. Um, so thanks everyone for contributing to that. It's really interesting to to get your real time input there. Veronique, I wonder if you have any uh, reflections on the results that we're seeing from the poll at this point. Um, yeah, actually, I'm quite surprised at how high the local NGOs are faring. Um, I would have thought that there would have been more votes in some ways for the community and faith-based organizations. I think it's really important when we talk about local humanitarian actions that it doesn't have to be action that's carried out by an organization that defines itself as humanitarian. Um, there are many, many actors out there that contribute to humanitarian outcomes, uh, but do not define themselves as humanitarians. And I think faith actors are one of them, faith communities as well. We often talk about faith actors, but forget about the communities um, that can be um, really important in the role they play in protection um, as well as assistance. Um, so yeah, I was surprised that so many people said local NGOs. I would have thought there would have been more around yeah, community-based organizations, faith-based organizations. Um, and really good to see though that there's a recognition that local humanitarian action and local actors includes uh, local authorities and national governments that can greatly contribute um, to um, alleviating suffering in humanitarian crisis. Of course, it's a bit more complicated in a conflict situation, uh, but even then you see local authorities playing a role um, even in conflict. Um, so that's, that's also good to see. Yeah, so, um, so Veronique, uh, if you don't mind, perhaps we'll, we'll stay with you and um, uh, Move to uh, now temporarily the um, like more a global a global policy perspective, and hopefully we'll be be able to jump back to to Jock and Esbaba um, soon. So um, you've you've carried out a lot of uh, research on partnerships and capacity strengthening in in different contexts. Um, many of the people on the line today um, are working in South Sudan and Nigeria, uh, but we do have a lot of people from from other contexts as well. Um, for example. 
example, Melody, uh, who's a participant today based in Hong Kong, has asked, I wonder whether these recommendations will be applicable outside the African context. To what extent are they connected to local culture and what can other regions learn? So, uh, so what do you think? Do these results from Nigeria and South Sudan resonate with you based, based on what you've heard from uh, organizations in other contexts? Over to you. Yeah, and actually, when um, I was thinking through this event, I was thinking a lot of research work I did in Ukraine um, of all contexts, which is uh, quite different from um, from the African context. Um, and it was really, really interesting in terms of um, Ukraine, especially being a country that, unlike um, South Sudan, and Jock made that point really well, that South Sudan, there is an aid culture because there has been, unfortunately, um, you made an crisis for a long time. But in Ukraine, um, when we went in to do the research, we had that big questions around um, humanitarian principles um, and how they reflected or how they were perceived by, by local actors. Um, and in that research, we were looking at how uh, local, more informal volunteer groups were negotiating access and whether they were using and keeping to the humanitarian principles. So um, it was a very interesting conversation. And, and one of the things that really was striking for me in that conversation in Ukraine that I hear as Baba and Jock reflecting as well um, was the fact that um, you made in principles, although Ukrainian volunteers were often not calling them that, um, when they heard about it in those terms, they said, of course, yes, that's what we've been using all along even before you told us these were humanitarian principles. And this principle made a lot of sense to them operationally. Um, I think just to say that adding to that, a lot of the volunteers had additional principles on top of that. And volunteerism was one of them. I, I would say the local volunteers were doing research with the main critique they had of international actors, um, humanitarian actors, was that they looked at this as a job. Um, and not as caring for the communities and, and for people. And I think, again, this point was made by Isbaba and Jock around that relationship for why a lot of those actors are doing what they're doing. Um, and so that was interesting that, yeah, the American principle resonate a lot with this. Um, and yes, generally, I found the findings of this uh, research to resonate um, with all the research experience I've had. Um, and especially for me, what resonated a lot was this lack of opportunity to share experiences and exchange between international and local actors within partnerships on how to contextualize the principles and how to translate them into operational strategies. For me, that was something that really resonated. And I think, unfortunately, throughout my research, one of the things we found, and of course, this is a broad generalization, was that a lot of international actors made assumptions about their ability to uphold the humanitarian principles and they made assumptions on their capacity and often they lack the humility to realize that they didn't understand some of the nuances of the local dynamics of the community dynamics and that um, undermined their ability to translate and operationalize the humanitarian principles um, and i think that's where the local actors are really bringing that added value but that can only happen within equitable partnerships where the voice of local actors is valued, where their expertise, their experience and their knowledge is valued. And what I found through my research was that unfortunately those voices are often undervalued and they're not seen as expertise or experience that international actors can can rely on. And I, hopefully this is changing, but I think that's where there's a real change. And what international actors can bring as an added value is their experience from other countries. But that only works if, again, they trust local actors to say that experience from that other country actually would be really good for here or that one doesn't quite work because of the context. Got it. Thank you so much. So a, a lot of resonance there and so, some very interesting um, uh, connections. Um, so I think that we do have the connections working again Again now, now um, again, as I as I was saying, we'll have to ask you to be very brief. But I do want to pose this one follow up question to you, Jock. This is from Raman, who was asking about. Um, you were talking about gatekeepers. So Raman wrote, "When you say gatekeepers, who are so many different kinds of stakeholders, how do you experience their role in terms of being either enable enablers or inhibitors of local leadership? How do you see their role in?" 
in either facilitating or otherwise uh, in terms of um, better relief access to affected communities. So over to you for a, a brief reflection on this, Chuck. Okay. Yes, when they are uh, government agencies, whether administrators or uh, relief workers themselves employed by the state, uh, there is a great potential for them to be inhibitors uh, because of their desire to control the way aid is done, uh, because that's what they do. The government tries to control people. Uh, but when they are uh, other actors, such as community leaders, faith leaders, uh, youth associations, women's groups, uh, they become highly effective in facilitating a principled humanitarian work because their voices then are included as representing their constituencies. So that's in, in short. The, the, pro the main issue with the gatekeepers uh, is that the state itself wants to be party to the delivery of aid when the state has failed initially to do the best thing, which is to take care of its people without the need for outsiders to come. Therefore, there is a bit of mistrust between the, by the local people to the government of their country. And I think that can make aid delivery a bit more difficult. Thank you. Got it. Thank you so much, Jock. Now, I'd like to move on to our second theme, which is principled humanitarian delivery. And a focus of the research was to look at principled humanitarian action in, huma in conflict context, specifically, uh, with which we, uh, we normally mean being informed by the principles of humanity, impartiality, independence, and neutrality. When discussing this with the actors in South Sudan, and I'm staying with you on this now, Jock, uh, what was their understanding of the relevance of these humanitarian principles and what challenges did they face when trying to implement them? Back to you. Thank you very much. There are probably two or three major uh, ways to understand it and the challenges faced in it. Uh, the first one is that uh, the concept of humanitarian principles is assumed by the outsiders, that the outside international NGOs and donor countries as the preserve of those outside uh, uh, actors. Uh, whereas the local people think that they are just the basis for their own involvement in this space. And it's not to be, to be, to be assumed that uh, one is more principled and the other is not. Because if you look, um, as, as, as Gloria, I think it was Gloria talking about um, the, the application of um, uh, these concepts, um, and the local people say that, yes, we do these things. Uh, you may not call them humanitarian principles, but they are the same principles, uh, where we are seeking equity and, and, and fairness. Uh, and, and compassion and humanity. We are, these are the stuff that uh, make us go, get, get up every morning to go to work in, 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 in a complex environment. Uh, the challenge in, to them in, in being able to do what they say they are in it for uh, is uh, this idea that uh, they, are, uh, they, can be, they can be enhanced. The, the principles can be enhanced by partnership between international and local NGOs, donors and, and, and local NGOs, but that these partnerships are built on the basis uh, of a lopsided power relations, where the, those bringing the money have much more say on, on what should be done. And those receiving are not involved at the inception level, such that planning can be done in uh, including their views in the planning stage. And all they get is a kind of subcontracting. When it has already been decided, the money has been decided, the principles have been uh, addressed, and then handed over to the lo local actors simply to implement what other people have already decided. And that is a, uh, that was a, a major, uh, all across the, our interviews um, and focus groups, this is the recurrent theme that um, the idea that we are simply implementers of decisions made so far away from us makes the, 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 the partnerships based on principles uh, not work very well. Uh, the, the, the enhancement of these principles through partnership falls uh, far short 
of its potential because of that element of power relations. Got it. Thank you very much. Um, now, stay. <laughs> Staying uh, on on this theme of principles, I'd like to turn now back to Esbaba. Um, how did what Jock has told us now of the situation in South Sudan relate to your own findings in Nigeria regarding humanitarian principles? Not not much not much different. Um, I, I I think this um, these things are quite. When we talk about um, the humanitarian principles, they're quite um, uh, ubiquitous. They're, they're present they're everywhere because it stands um, in the local context. They believe those things are also necessary. Um, what what we had though, were, and I, I you know I made mention of uh, one of the underlying assumptions um, that local and um, national NGOs are not principles. Um, what we could, what we got from interacting with the, the local actors um, was that, in fact, they they are consistently uh, practicing the humanitarian um, uh, principles in their action as they navigate um, those um, incredibly difficult situations or terrains at the community level. Uh, at, the, at the community level. Um, like like one like one of the um, local local actors this day, um, they when they see you and they see you as uh, one of them, they open up to you, um, and that is communication between all parties. When they see that you are not um, really one of them, uh, they clam up, um, not intentionally, but not knowing whether you 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 are. Uh, not only your your own objective in, in coming to them. So, truly, the concept of um, um, uh, delivering uh, humanitarian aid according to the four principles is is quite um, it's an accepted norm. Um, it's just that for the local actors in Nigeria, they talk about additional things that they have brought to bear to be able to uh, maneuver. Um, interestingly, um, a point that they keep making uh, with regard to this um, underlying assumption that they are not principles is the fact that um, uh, a few times they have also um, experienced um, um, our INGOs uh, uh, not sticking to um, one or two of the principles, uh, the concept of uh, impartiality, the concept of independence, uh, they talk about the fact that um, um, there are instances where um, uh, people in government, officials in government, um, influence decision making. Um, uh, the, 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 that is their perception, uh, I, I must say. But the bottom line at the end of the day is that it is there and it can be pointed out that um, an independent um, approach to humanitarian, um, uh, humanitarian delivery actually does have uh, problems that need to be navigated through while in the field. They've come up with other things that they believe they use, um, the, 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 the so-called cultural, um, um, traditional manner of engagement. Um, they've highlighted that, that even where it is stated that um, uh, these are the things that they are sticking to, uh, because they enter through those kind of um, engagement process, the communities tend to buy uh, the, the notion that they are interested in their welfare. Um, what, one thing we also did notice is that they are, the local actors are very, very key to balancing the humanitarian standards that we have out there um, by incorporating into it, though I would say on their own, um, which they pointed out subsequently that they would like an opportunity to work together with the donors, funders, um, NGOs, and NGOs to work together on how they can incorporate all of that without dropping any part of the known four principles, but incorporating the other things that they they have uh, they have done. Um, humanitarian principles should not be regarded uh, as exclusive of uh, what will ensure survival. Um, it is it takes everything into consideration. It brings in the prospects of subsequent development, the, uh, the prospect of uh, conflict resolution. 
So uh, in a nutshell, uh, that it's not really not different from what you see in South Sudan. It's just that we um, they were able to go uh, deeper into expressing their views. Uh, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks so much, S. Baba. I'm going to come right back to you on the third theme on humanitarian partnerships. But before I do, I just want to point out in case um, some of you haven't seen, we have several participants in the chat now who have uh, provided us, I think, with a, a really um, a really good, uh, uh, useful uh, interpretation of the poll results that we see there. Um, so in this uh, two part poll, uh, we've been uh, asking the participants right now how how well do staff of international versus local humanitarian actors understand humanitarian principles in, in their experience? And we do see uh, a bit of a distinction coming through there in the results uh, with more people saying um, international actors have a, a quote, adequate uh, understanding and a concern um, in people's experience that local actors have a, a poor understanding of humanitarian principles. But in the chat, we see several people um, um, pointing out that this um, uh, is likely um, a result of um, uh, putting putting the the same words on different ideas. So um, the idea that uh, although local actors may be um, uh, using their own vocabulary uh, to describe the principles under which they operate, and those uh, really are humanitarian principles um, in a general understanding. They're not necessarily referring to them by the, by the same words. So I think there are um, some different ways to look at that, but I, I very much um, uh, recommend people to, to take a look at the chat and participate in the very interesting discussion there about, about those results. Uh, as we move along to the next theme, which is to look at humanitarian partnerships. And uh, Esbaba, staying with you on this, um, how did respondents find um, partnerships with international organizations? Were they structured in a way that they found equitable and supportive? I know those are very two uh, important issues that came out of the, the research. I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit um, on uh, what you found um, in terms of perspectives on on actual partnerships uh, from the context you were looking at. Back to you, S. Baba. Oh yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, with regards to partnership, um, what uh, we could get from the perception of the actors there is that um, transaction transactional relationship is the norm. Um, we, 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 the way they talk about it, we feel, um, a, 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 should I say, they, they, some form of regret that it could be better. So, so in actual fact, there's a transactional attitude with the way they engage with the international organizations. Um, but we also had that they, from them that there's that appetite for more co-working to add value beyond the delivery of aid. Um, and in, in that wise, looking at uh, uh, the partnerships as, as able to set a scene of easy um, relationship management once the conflict um, can be reduced to a minimum. Um, local actors feel very angry uh, that they are, they are not treated equally. And when I talk about the uh, fact about this equal stuff, it's that um, the local actors feel that there is a preferential treatment to national NGOs. Uh, with, um, I'll probably just quickly move into that and talk about this bubble that you, you tend to find there, that there's an INGO, NNGO preferred partnership process. Um, while, while I can confirm that indeed, in the two partnership learning conversations that we had, you could see that there was a good relationship between the international um, um, NGOs and the national NGOs. Uh, but it was not lost on us that, if, that there was a, the fact that those entities, the, the Nigerian NGOs, were already known in the process. Um, um, I, 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 for, for example, in one of those partnership learning conversations, you could see that the, the two are already in the development world, I think, are that a relationship of partnership and bringing that level of trust, um, integrity that they've shared at that time into 
doing humanitarian work was easy. Uh, in, uh, in, our, in our conversation with them, you could see that um, the, the two organizations are, um, you know, working very fluently together. So the kind of point that the local actors were making with regards to not being treated equally is that there's no, there doesn't seem to be a deliberate or should I say uh, an open door policy um, to have partnerships um, extended into their own relationship with um, the INGOs. Um, they, they feel that uh, there's some kind of flaw, uh, flaws in the process of establishing um, and uh, implementing partnerships that if those kind of things can be managed, they believe that there will be a positive impact on the efficiency and effectiveness of human aid delivery. They, uh, here, they're talking about um, when you're going to establish that it must be a deliberate effort to remove that power imbalance that you see. There must be a deliberate effort to be ready to share, um, to share the risks that are, that are involved in the process. Um, they highlight the concept of security, the issue of security, and the fact that oftentimes they're left on their own. Um, there, is, there could be a better way. You know, the, the bottom line really is that, we, not to go into too much detail, is that there could be an improvement in the partnership process. They believe that the partnership can actually deliver more effectively, and it can also facilitate subsequent development opportunities in the, in the future. Um, Two key areas that, um, two key factors of uh, partnership that they also highlighted the concept of equality and the concept of equity. Um, for them, equality is just saying that respect us, see us and respect us as we are. You know, um, the, the, the uh, relationship management thing is do, do not look down on us, take, take us as, uh, as, we, as we are that we can contribute just like you are contributing. But then on the part of the equity thing, I mentioned it earlier, it has to do with the fact that um, in, in, in resource sharing, um, every, every little, in, in a diverse um, um, system where you have people with different kind of inputs into it, that they, that they should be valued for what they can bring into the partnership the ability to navigate the terrain easily, reach the community. I'm afraid we, we've just lost you, uh, Espaba, but we, we got um, a, a lot of content there from you. So let me turn now on the same question to Jock. Um, were partnerships viewed differently um, by the respondents uh, that you work with in South Sudan? Over to you, Jock. Uh, thank you. Um, the, the partnerships, uh, uh, we're not uh, viewed uh, particularly differently in terms of the goal. Why do we need to adhere to some of these basic principles? The answer is usually the same, and which is to, to provide uh, a better humanitarian intervention. Uh, but the voices that we have heard challenged the underlying assumption that uh, local NGOs are not principled. And in fact, they, they say that they are more and more consistently humanitarian because they are navigating the incredible difficult terrain at the communal level to ensure that the humanitarian ethic is preserved in order to meet the priority needs. A uh, key issue from their voices is that their work, and not necessarily the, the, the humanitarian knowledge as a whole, but their relationship. Uh, with, the, with, the, with, the, with the donors and with the uh, international NGOs on the one hand and with the, uh, and, and the communities, the recipient communities, they, they, that relationship is, is extremely important. And they said that, uh, that humanitarian aid, uh, whether it is principal or otherwise, is really at the end of the day a function of human relationships. And these are nuanced and complex and, and circuitous relationships. These are not linear relationships. So the key to getting to the same page with partners is through understanding these nuances. Uh, if there are any disagreements, then at least um, they, they, they have a strong understanding of why 
and not based on assumptions or presumptions. And this has linked to uh, one key finding, uh, several findings, but I'll just mention one, which is that there is a real uh, appetite from local actors to be part of a dialogue and a part of exchange uh, about the application of humanitarian principles in order to reach uh, shared understandings. Uh, even if there are differences, at least these differences will be based on genuine understanding and, and rather than uh, uh, these presumptions. I think it is important to underline that all sides are agreed on the concept and these principles. What they, where, where there seem to be disconnect is the, the relationships that are based on power relations, uh, where one party uh, provides the funds and the ideas and the concepts and even the guidelines to how to do it and the other party is simply receiving orders and try as best as possible to be humanitarian because they are committed to the welfare of the people they serve. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jock. We're going to um, uh, move on now to theme four, and I ap apologize again regarding the the connection, Esbaba, but we'll be uh, <coughs> coming to you, uh, coming back to you in the context of of theme four. Um, so, so hopefully you can uh, also finish uh, any thoughts that you had lingering um, at that time. But let me um, to start out with theme four. Uh, I'll stick with uh, with Jock. So we've received a lot of questions um, before today's event regarding how partnerships and principles relate in conflict contexts, uh, including, for example, from Hamed in Turkey, who's wondering how partners should interact specifically in conflict situations. Uh, so, Jock, if we look at how the respondents saw the connection between humanitarian principles and partnership principles, what were the um, partnerships uh, as carried out in practice um, uh, seen as sufficiently supporting uh, principled action. Over to you, Jock. Yes. Um, yes, the, the, there is definitely a very clear link in the minds of people who are working in this space, international and local, that uh, partnerships advances principles. Uh, and the way it does it is that the local people provide the local knowledge and become the guides in terms of how to navigate the complex social relations that exist in the local community, which can, in many situations, can derail aid. And that um, the, the local people can become the guide to everybody else in, in, in how to how to manage, uh, navigate, and circumvent some potentially uh, harming practices uh, that can derail the humanitarian, uh, principal humanitarian deliveries, uh, including the, uh, the, the government and in the case of the contacts, warring parties trying to, uh, to control um, aid flows, uh, with one party sometimes trying to deny their oppo the, an area that is perceived to be under the control of their opponent, denying them aid, um, and that in, when such situations happen, uh, the partnership uh, works the best for the local people to be the ones trying to address those issues, those, those com complex issues at that local level in order to make aid really target the people who need it most and not to become, a, a, uh, not to become a, a, an unintended negative consequence uh, in terms of conflict, i.e., army is being fed uh, from relief instead of going to the people who are starving, for example. Uh, and it is usually that local knowledge which makes it possible for aid to, be, to, be, to, to, to try as much as possible to give as much more significant part of aid to the people who deserve it, even if some get diverted by warring parties and armies. After all, these armies are sometimes considered members of the families that have received so to what extent can the humanitarian principles shared between these two groups uh, with the government standing on the side, obviously can also be a third uh, entity here, uh, or the warring parties can be another entity, but in that collaboration between outsiders, outside NGOs, international NGOs and local NGOs means that uh, this treacherous environment that has the possibility of de derailing aid can be addressed 
by local knowledge that uh, interna uh, that local NGOs uh, workers uh, have, and, and, uh, and also uh, advising the international NGO workers on issues of security, even safety of staff, can be a challenge in a contact situation. And I think um, the partnership uh, enhances the ability of NGOs uh, to improve delivery of aid. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Chuck. Now, on, on the same question to Esbaba, what was the linkage between principles and partnerships in Nigeria? Did you see uh, the, the same uh, coming through your research there, um, as we've just heard from Jock? Over to you, uh, Esbaba. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Um, indeed, I, um, I, I, I think um, the results from Nigeria share um, uh, uh, essentially the same thing as Jock has um, uh, described. Um, there's the understanding and appreciation that a collaborative attempt, a collaborative work relationship actually will deliver better our humanitarian um, um, aid uh, delivery. Uh, the, the, the additional thing that I would just like to, uh, to mention is, is that um, in, in making sure that that delivery is uh, uh, most effective or the optimum that we can, we can get, um, there, there's going to need to be a dedicated focus to um, working with local NGOs. Um, uh, on the one hand, the local NGOs see that they themselves um, need to build their uh, ability to interact well with the INGOs. Um, the INGOs uh, have partners. They, they have those partners, the NNGOs that they relate with. Um, maybe one or two uh, local NGOs are also in partnership format. We're, we're not certain. We didn't get anybody that uh, was in that class. But with the partnership that we saw, there's the desire to have it. And it is seen that that partnership actually does aid delivery out there in the field. Now, um, so like Doc said, working with people who bring the contextual thing, the, 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 the local um, uh, scenario into, into the equation, the ability to navigate uh, those different entities that perform different um, stop and search uh, kind of thing in access to communities. Um, it is very, very uh, clear in our research that working together across the spectrum in both a vertical and horizontal way. And when I use the term vertical and horizontal, I'm talking about from the that hierarchical thing that we see with the funders going down uh, right through the system to the people who go to the coal fields, as well as within the system, we're looking at a bunch or a group of um, uh, local NGOs that they could be brought to work together in an, uh, in an overall overarching partnership format in which everybody has a contribution that they're making. And you don't have pillars or columns of transactional engagement that are going on towards reaching people who need help. So um, we, we, we feel from that study that it is obvious that the local NGOs themselves want to work together. They agitate for it. They made it as part of their recommendation. They agitate for it. At the same time, they want a, a, an opportunity to work in that uh, partnership relationship with INGOs and NNGOs. They feel there's not enough of that. Um, uh, and um, I, I can't remember what else you asked me about, but that's essentially what we could see that brings that linkage to, be, to become very important. Um, was there any question that you asked me again that I've not responded to? No, I, I think it's uh, it's well covered, uh, Esbaba. Thank you very much. Um, I will be coming to to ask both you and Jock, as well as the others, uh, about the the key recommendations. But actually, I think we're going to save that for the end um, uh, in the uh, in the wrap up. Um, and so now I'm going to turn to Gloria, if I may. I'd like to uh, see if we can 
can take a look at how um, uh, how we can relate these results that we've heard about uh, to actually the the work of one of the actors concerned. So uh, we'll turn to to Gloria. Um, we've heard about the results of this research from South Sudan and Nigeria, and yourself as the CEO of a South Sudanese NGO, Titi Foundation. I'd like to ask you um, first how these results resonated with you, uh, and are these issues that you've also faced in some of your partnerships with international actors. Over to you, Gloria. Okay, I will do that. Thank you. Well, um, I'm say, I was saying that the research work actually resonates very clearly with um, what is the reality on the ground, and especially when it comes down to how um, partnerships are built when it comes down to um, relationships between um, local and international organizations. Firstly, we have, um, for a very long time, seen the lack of trust between international and multilateral, so as um, local actors. And therefore, in the sense that, you know, um, one of the major conversations is always been on the issue around local partners not having sufficient um, capacity or they do not understand the principles and things of the nature. But I think um, for our context in that zone at the moment, there's been tremendous, I would say, um, efforts put um, by partners, especially um, working, working with you know, the different groups like um, under the NGO program membership, whereby there's a lot of ongoing advocacy on the importance of um, shared capacity when it comes down to both local and international. We understand that both parties cannot work in isolation because they, they, they all bring um, a different blend of things to the table. And so that then we're able to ensure that the consistent and efficient delivery of services to the majority of the vulnerable populations within the country. Um, then some of the challenges that we are seeing at City Foundation has mainly been on the issues around the contractual um, side of partnerships, whereby most times we seen that you know um, local agencies are just constructed for the sake of delivering a particular task and that is the end. And in most times these contractual um they services to local national NGOs is that it's quite short term and most times between three to six months and you know the project is over. There's no sense of continuity when it comes down to that. And at the same time it comes in with so much um risk transfer towards the local actors who are unfortunately the front line actors in the field and without consideration on how to you know resolve issues of risk transfer towards that partner. Because the resources the actually that appear towards the local actor most times is the way you know um something fixed by international actors. So I must say though that um for a context specifically city foundation that it has been that is with all the partners, know their partners, the international organizations that I think have also been able to you know um open up I say status within the institution whereby we are able to put our input and how we want um, the quality of partnership to look like. So, um, for example, in South Sudan, also we do have at the moment the localization within group, where the issues around partnership, you know, um, with the different stakeholders, international organizations, the new agencies, who do you know, um, gear the shift to be able to be more. Um, more palatable to all the stakeholders involved within the humanitarian architecture. Um, but then the other risk that is coming in is that um, the, the generalization and even when it comes down to the issue of this particular report, that they haven't given a segregation on the issues around um, women's rights for women-led organizations to reflect within the report. And how issues around partnerships also affect them, which I think would be um would be great to actually um to be seen actually um, you know, from this research, but unfortunately that is not happening. And it is the same context also that when we come down to the realities of partnerships on the ground, 
in most times and cases, we see that women led organizations are generally categorized as local actors, and that is it. There's no that specification. And in most cases, the activities are also on the mainstream through other journals, you know. So I think um, the need for that kind of clarification to be able to come up clearly because I think the issue around the involvement of women rights organizations within um, the conversation in the table is quite key. And I think it brings a different dynamic on gender related matters when it comes down to the interventions we do from that. Over to you. Thank you so much, Gloria. You, as you were um, ending there, you were touching on the issue of gender, um, uh, which is of great interest. As we know, we had a number of questions come up. Um, for example, a question from Willow in Somalia, who is asking, how do we ensure that the voices of women are included as equal partners? I wonder, Gloria, would you be able to elaborate just briefly uh, a bit more on, on that question from Willow in Somalia? Over to you. Thank you so much. Um, well, I think basically it is about the acceptance from the different stakeholders when it comes down to the humanitarian um, leadership within a particular context. At the moment, in the case of South Sudan, um, different partners, um, including the localization working group, and then um, we have institutions like CARE and CAPOD that are backing us up on the NGO forum to ensure that you know, there's a fair representation on the table when it comes down to the different platforms, which includes the HCT, which is the humanitarian coordination team, includes the advisory board to the South Sudan Humanitarian Fund, where I think. So um, it's all about the willingness, you know, when people are ready to accept the voices of women, within, and not just women, but directly local women, because they also do have a specific context in which they understand, you know, their local, um, their local architecture, then it becomes, um, it becomes a little bit easier to, when that space is provided for them. But not until the space is provided, then it still, you know, it still continues being the ordinary conversation that, you know, the gender representation, because that is always a tick in the box that everyone does, but then um, the reality and practice of it is certainly not what is being portrayed on the papers that are against, you know, on to the donors or even to the public. Over to you. Great. Thanks again, Gloria. Very much appreciated. Um, so now I'd like to turn back to Veronique. We um, we were able to gather some of your your insights earlier, um, thinking generally about um, about whether the results uh, that we're hearing about now from Nigeria and South Sudan resonate for you, and and from what you've heard from other contexts. I'd like to come back to you now more specifically um, again with the results from Nigeria and South Sudan in mind. How do you see the principles of partnership and the humanitarian principles working together. Uh, we have a question on this from um, uh, from Isufi, uh, who's working in Mali, uh, asking whether there are ways that these sets of principles clash with each other. Uh, and uh, I would also like to add to Isufi's question, is there a way that they can be structured to, uh, so as to reinforce each other? We, we've heard some hints uh, at this um, throughout the discussion today, and I wonder uh, what your thoughts are. Veronique, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, I mean, I don't think per se this, the, the principles of partnerships and humanitarian principles clash with each other. Um, I think where they clash is when the humanitarian principles are used, and unfortunately that happens a lot in the attitudes um, and, and the, the, the interactions between international and local actors, when the humanitarian principles are used as almost as a gatekeeping, um, when they are used as saying local actors cannot uphold them and therefore we shouldn't relinquish control, we should maintain control over the relationship and that leads to then having more contractual partnerships. So I think it's in how you position the principles vis-a-vis -vis local actors. Um, and there they can clash in the sense that if you f believe that local actors cannot 
uh, maintain the humanitarian principles and therefore you need to maintain control, then you wouldn't believe that uh, equitable partnerships should be the way forward. Um, the problem is, um, as, as many of us have said on this, on this panel, and I've seen um, quite a lot in the chat around this, the problem is that um, we cannot, we, the claim that local actors um, are unable to maintain the Western principles is one that is of a, a negative perception, not of reality, and definitely not um, uh, definitely not a reality where international actors are perfect in implementing the Western principles and local actors are not. Um, and I think it was Janet who mentioned that in the chat um, and who said, you know, we. Uh, we need to recognize that um, the understanding of humanitarian principle uh, is not really the issue, it's, it's impl implementing them and that both international and local actors struggle. And I think one of the problems is that there is no, and that was reflected really well in, in the recommendation of, of, of the report, there is no honest dialogue from both sides on that challenge and that struggle because unfortunately local actors often are told if you can't do that, if you can't maintain the principles, we can't partner with you as international actors. So as long as these principles are used almost as, as a weapon um, against local humanitarian action, there's never going to be an honest conversation about it. Um, and unless there is also an honest conversation from international actors who talk about their own struggle and challenges, you won't have that honest dialogue and, and that, um, that conversation that needs to happen for humanitarian principles and uh, principles of partnerships to reinforce each other and to, um, to work it with each other. And I think, yes, yeah, so honest dialogue is necessary, um, dealing with that lack of trust that exists between actors and as well as really opening ourselves to relying a lot more on the analysis solutions and experiences of local actors and communities themselves to inform how best to operationalize the principles. Great. Thank you very much. Um, now, we've heard uh, of the challenges from the perspectives of local actors, and there are also a lot of questions coming in from participants about the role of international actors. Uh, for example, uh, Aurore in Switzerland is wondering about the role of donors, and uh, both Monzer in Turkey and Rahman in Iraq are asking about how the principles of partnership can be best implemented in practice. I'd like to turn to to Jonas, um, what are some of the practicalities of partnerships from an INGO perspective that you find challenging in this regard? Or another way to put it, um, assuming that there is in fact a willingness to address these issues, why don't we already have the equitable and supportive partnerships that everybody is calling for and everybody is looking for? Uh, what is holding us back? Over to you, Jonas. Thank you very much, and also thank you to everybody for the interesting comments in, in the in the chat. And just to, to pick up from Ver Veronique, I think this study was exactly to start the conversation around some of these t difficult topics and get a shared sort of sharing. Because if I'm to say, look at back at the church aid that I work for, clearly we are also struggling to operationalize the humanitarian principles, and we are trying as best as possible to implement quality partnership. And I will let others that are participating in the call of the partners of DCA sort of judge whether we we actually succeeding. I don't think that's for me to, deserve, to, to decide on this. What I do think in terms of the, the question, what we are finding is, and the others has referenced this also, is the whole aid architecture. It is the fact that the funding we get for is primarily focusing on humanitarian needs. It's often very short term. It has to be used and, and uh, in, in a very short time frame, allowing very little time for, for consultations, participations, for true partnerships and all the things that we sort of the words that we use around partnerships. And I think the places where DCA have succeeded in this has been is in countries where we've had a really a long multi-year engagement where it's the same partners over a long time, because I, I absolutely also agree to the fact to the statement that partnerships advances principles and that collaboration basically deliver better aid. I'm a strong believer in that and I think we actually have evidence from that but I do think there's a conversation we need to have with the back donors that we have so humanitarian needs cannot be only seen as needs. You need to look at the pr approaches also and understanding the limitation on how you actually deliver that aid. If you don't have that part of the equation I think actually the aid is delivered in a wrong way and you might actually defeat the purposes that you're trying to serve. So for seen from, from a from Dan Church Aiden point of view, it's a conversation we need to have also with donors. But it's not all about blaming the donors. I 
think we need to take on a responsibility also as, as NGOs working in that partnership, making sure. And there's several comments saying, what about capacity building? How do you make sure that, that that's also an integrated part of, of the partnership? And clearly it needs to be also so that you can uh, jointly advance and money needs to be dedicated for this also. Now, all of this is easy said and several of you have said, what is new in this? Well, nothing, but it, I just, to me, it's an ongoing conversation. It's the responsibility of all of us, basically, in the humanitarian community to challenge the back donors, the, the people with the money on these things, making sure that they can put the right frameworks under which we can then operate and deliver the best aid. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jonas. And um, uh, just a quick note to say we are pulling a little bit over time as a result of our connection issues, but I, I hope that all of you will will be able to hang uh, hang on with us for just a couple more minutes as we would like to do one more round um, around this virtual table. I'd like to ask uh, each of our panelists just very briefly to um, highlight uh, what for them, uh, maybe one or two of the, the key uh, findings or recommendations from this report. I saw the question coming in in the chat and I think Jonas, uh, you were referring to that as well, um, uh, asking uh, in this research, what's new? Uh, what's uh, what's really the the new added value? Uh, what have we discovered um, uh, through through this uh, current effort that we didn't know before about um, partnerships and the challenges and what we need to do? Um, so maybe with that question in mind, we can go around first to uh, Veronique, then to Esbaba, Jock, Gloria, and then finally to Jonas um, for some very brief uh, concluding thoughts along these lines. Um, so over to you, Veronique. Um, I mean, I think going back to that issue of what's new, um, I think, of course, this study reiterates a lot of issues that is already present in a lot of, of, of the localization literature. But what is very sad is that when you review that literature, um, the same recommendations come up again and again. So it's about now implementing those, those recommendations. Um, and for me, as I said, the one thing that really was um, stuck with me and, and Jonas just reiterated it is that need for that honest dialogue uh, moving forward um, to really encourage international actors to talk with the local actors they work with um, and to have that really honest conversations about how do we implement the American principles, how can the partnership be improved to allow that honest conversation, what are we not what are we not doing? What space are we not giving you so that you can also voice these experiences and feel that you're contributing to that conversation? Excellent. Thanks so much, Veronique. And we really appreciate your joining the panel today. Thanks so much for taking the time. Uh, now, I'd like to turn to Esbaba for your, your closing thoughts uh, on uh, recommendations and what you would highlight from the report. Over to you. All right. Thank, thank you very much. Um, it's just one one thing I am uh, uh, one thing I'd like to highlight, and uh, the um, uh, the fact that um, there is a need to fully explore by all parties um, the need to uh, you know agree um, how we how we will go ahead with the um, infusion of the partnership principles uh, along with the um, um, humanitarian principles in delivering aid. Very, it's very, it requires some level of investment. Um, somebody did talk about capacity building. Somebody um, uh, uh, also asked what is new, but what, what I see coming out of this is the urgency of um, getting into that um, discussion mode and practicalizing the things that have evolved from here uh, when we were looking through a literature search, we see that quite, indeed a number of discussions had gone on, but um, still nothing had happened. So maybe right now, the fact that we've come up with quite a number of things from the local perspective uh, tells us of the urgency there is uh, needed in it. Then we need to remove we need to remove um, this um, veil that we that we put on, um, which we open for some people and we do not open for everybody. Uh, the, the concept to me is that everybody must come into the tent and we must get maximize the contribution that all the people involved, local actors, um, uh, international NGOs, I, um, and um, possibly the funders, and arrive at a, a way to go in putting partnership 
to be uh, critical to the delivery of aid. Uh, thank you. I'll stop there. Thanks so much, Espaba. It's been great having you uh, in the events and very much appreciate your contribution. I'd like to turn now to Jock. Over to you. Hello. Thank you. Um, yeah, one or two things. Um, the There is an observation that has emerged uh, strongly in South Sudan, which is that uh, because funding there is no funding directly going to the local NGOs. The funding goes to the international NGOs who then uh, 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 give funding to the local NGOs. And as a result, many years of, of such practice have led to a situation where the most prominent, the most established, probably the ones who speak the best English NGOs are the ones are repeatedly being funded uh, in a, so in a way that process has inserted yet another layer of marginalization where the less known the less visible NGOs don't get anything because on their own they cannot get since donor money doesn't go directly to local ones but through partnerships they are not partnering with anyone because the partnerships have already been established to the best known. So I think that process really needs to be to be reset so that there is no yet another layer of marginalization there. Uh, secondly, um, the, the, the local NGOs have spoken very, very strongly about the need, if the partnerships are to be really strong and meaningful, the local NGO voices need to be included at the project inception level such that their voices are built into the design, into the funding, and into the deliveries uh, of this, uh, instead of the whole thing being designed somewhere else and only handed over to them as a finished product, which they will now be asked to deliver. Then all the problems that come up, which could have been preempted at the design level, are now having to be dealt with at the implementation level. And that is costly and it leads to breakdown of aid. Lastly, there is uh, the elephant in the room, especially about South Sudan, and that is why do we need international aid in the first place? And the reason you need it is because the government has failed in its fundamental responsibilities for welfare of its people. So then aid <coughs> should not become an alibi or uh, let the local leadership off the hook by the donors simply throwing money at the problem and not engaging in political solutions or in search for political solutions. I think that has come up quite uh, strongly in, uh, in the context of South Sudan, but I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jock, um, for your contributions today. Greatly appreciated. And now moving to Gloria. I hope we still have you on the line for concluding remarks, Gloria. Thank you so much. Um, well, I would like to conclude by saying that it is key for us to recognize that our compliance with humanitarian principles affects our credibility as humanitarian actors. Secondly, is that when it comes down to principled partnerships, I think the conversation that we need to have a discussion on now is how do we facilitate or make an enabling environment for the issues around quality partnership to come up to be articulated clearly without marginalizing the other party? We need to start having conversations with actors, both local, international, and multilateral, and even sometimes the donors need to start opening up the space for this kind of conversation because in most cases, they hold the key by ensuring that the only partner with multilateral or INGOs and they leave aside, you know, um, the local access. And this is where we start having initial problems of program design right at the start of everything and, you know, without the involvement of the local context in this kind of conversation. So I think all actors, um, it's quite clear that all actors actually, you know, open up that space and allow for every every actor to be you know, involved in these processes. 
so that we know what we're talking about. And it takes deliberate effort for that to happen. I'll give a good example. For example, at the moment, we have a particular kind of um, meeting group with SCDA at headquarters level. And some of these things where we have conversations around these issues around you know, partnerships. So I think it would be quite encouraging if all donors could also adopt a similar kind of approach so that we do not have the um, we do not have a lot of intermediaries during this kind of conversation but there's a space for all of us to be able to be indulged in and have this um this conversation together and then shape the way we want partnerships to look like. Um, a final remark would be that we also need to ensure that in, in all our dealings in partnership, we have to ensure that the gender angle is um, quite well articulated in it. In most times, for cases, we find that the issues around women rights organizations, the women-led organizations, is left aside and they're all grouped under one category, national NGOs or local actors, wherever they are. Um, which is not quite right, I think, because this category of individuals or organizations actually bring in an element, a gender element that we all need to ensure that it's encompassed within our interventions to ensure that, you know, um, there's proper or adequate delivery of services to um, the different um, interventions that we, that we conduct in the different um, locations that, you know, everyone does the activities in. And I think when that happens, then I think we're moving in towards an open way of, you know, um, creating this relationship. And it's time then we build trust among ourselves and nobody sees each other as, you know, um, superior or inferior, but we see each other as complementing partners you know, that are there to support one another because we all do have different abilities and things to bring on the table. Thank you so much and over to you. Thank you very much, Gloria. We really appreciate your, your being a part of the panel today. Um, now turning to Jonas, some brief concluding remarks. I think I want to focus in on, on the humanitarian principles. Um, and I think I'll, I'll do this because I think um, if you look at the world where we are going with an increasing number of refugees, internal displaced, higher level of conflicts, I really do think that it is so important that we challenge ourselves to the understanding on what humanitarian principles look like in this world. They were devised a long time ago. And I think the actors uh, are very diverse. We heard that from today's discussion also. So I think that space where we can have that and that needs to include donors and UN and I don't know from the survey how many actually participate in this call but I, I really my big hope and recommendation is that we can bring sort of today's discussion and, and this survey also into fora where we can sort of reignite this discussion and understand them in the context of today um, and how actually because otherwise I really foresee that aid will not be delivered in the most effective way and I'm, I think colleagues in, in the panelists uh, the panelists here have talked to a lot of other things that can also be handled or that should be looked at but I think really for me that's the most important thing right now, I think, to, as we move forward with, with this discussion. So thanks a lot for this opportunity. Absolutely, our pleasure. And thank you, Jonas, uh, for being a part of it. Um, and I, draw, uh, picking up on, on your point there regarding a continuing the conversation, I'd just like to point out, if you haven't seen, we have really a rich uh, collection of responses now to both of these poll questions here, uh, asking participants uh, in the event today, what you consider to be the biggest challenge to transforming partnerships and also your number one recommendation. Uh, we have a lot of input there. So thanks so much to everybody uh, who's contributed to today's discussion. And I hope that you will find opportunities to continue um, to engage on these issues. Um, these uh, results of the polls uh, will be made available after the event. So if you'd like to dig into that in greater detail, um, you're very uh, welcome to do that. They'll be posted on the event page. So um, with that, we will have to wrap up now. And I am so grateful that uh, you are all 
able to stay with us as uh, we went over time uh, a bit here, but it was a very valuable discussion. Um, so just some concluding uh, housekeeping points. We will have a recording of the events today, um, both in video and audio only podcast format that will be available on the event page in the coming days together with other resources such as the, um, uh, the poll results, as I mentioned. Also, uh, we will follow up with the speakers to see if they'll be able to answer some of the questions that we did not have the time to address in real time today. Uh, we'll be posting those in the PHAP community where you can all continue the discussion until the next event or until your next opportunity um, to follow up on these issues together. Um, I would also like to point out we have an event next Thursday, um, so that's the 10th of June. We'll be organizing an event together with ICFA, which focuses on one aspect of what we discussed today, risk management and funding partnerships, which may be of interest to some of you. You can click on the link um, that you see now in the chat to register for that. And um, uh, if you have any questions about that, of course, feel free to, to reach out to us, but hope to see many of you in next week's event as well. So with that, I would like to thank everyone, panelists and all of the participants for a very interesting discussion today and very valuable. And I'll wish you a good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Uh, depending on where you were connecting from. With that, it's Anherid Lang and the team from PHAP signing off from Geneva. Thank you very much. Goodbye.